It leads me to everybody. Once again, I'd like to welcome you to our Wednesday night Bible study here at Grace First Baptist Church. Good evening, everybody. Once again, I'd like to welcome you to our Wednesday night Bible study here at Grace First Baptist Church. Pray that the Lord will bless our time together. Pray that we will grow together in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Once again, it's good to be here. It's good to have you listening and watching as we go through the psalm together. At Grace First Baptist Church, we started going through the Psalms maybe a year, a year or so ago, and we called it Traveling Through the Psalms. And so tonight, as we travel, we'll find our stop at Psalm 94, Psalms 94. And before we get into the Psalms, as usual, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer, but we've got a couple of prayer requests. I want to pray for Brother Joe Wilson. He's going to have surgery on Tuesday. Brother Fred C.'s mother, she's sick. Mary Bohannon's sister, she's still sick. I want to pray for her. Sister Eleanor Denny, recovering from surgery. Sister Linda Anthony's father, he's still sick. Sister Lee's stepmother, she's in rehab. Sister Tommy Lee, want to pray that God will bless her, watch over and keep her. I want to pray for the bereaved again, the Brown family, the Terrafair family. Board family, um, those families whom we don't know about who are still going through, we ask the Lord to bless, bless them. Uh, also, I pray for one another. In times like these, we need all the prayer we can get. So as we go before God's throne, remember to pray for those whom we called out and remember to pray for one another. Let us pray. Oh, Lord God, we bow in your presence once again. We thank you for being the God that you are. Thank you for power. You have it all in heaven and earth. Thank you for knowledge. You know everything. Thank you for wisdom. Thank you for perfect love. Thank you for being holy. Thank you for being everywhere present. Thank you for Jesus who died on the cross for our sins. Through his shed blood, we have the forgiveness of sins and eternal life. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who indwells us. Father, we can't praise you enough and give thanks to you enough for all the great things you've done in our life. So we ask you to forgive us of our sins and those who sin against us. For those we called out today on our prayer request list, we ask you to meet their needs according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. We pray not only you bless these on the prayer list, but you bless Sharon Nobles and her mother. Pray you bless Sister Drew. Pray you bless so many others, Lord, who are listening to me in the sound of my voice, whether it be good friends of the ministry in Alabama who are going through, but we know that you are able, whether it be people who are watching us right here in San Antonio who need you to just touch their bodies, we know that you can fix their situation. Our country, we need you. Our leadership needs you. Our president, vice president, all those in authority need you to touch their bodies and minds and give them guidance into our righteousness. Once again, bless our doctors and nurses, bless our teachers and administrators. As children are trying to go back to school and parents are trying to figure out how to educate their children and keep them safe at the same time and maintain a job. We all need you. So we ask you, Lord, to be with us all. Now, bless Grace First Baptist Church and its populace, our members who are being so generous and so gracious, and then bless those members and those who are watching us all over YouTube and Facebook. May they know that as you touch them, they've been in the presence of the Almighty God. Now have your way in our hearts and minds that we may grow in Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So tonight, um, I want to ask you guys right off the bat, if you give me your titles, if you guys have some titles, once again, we're in Psalm 94, Psalms 94, Psalms 94. If anybody has a title for Psalm 94, uh, we would appreciate that if you would give us that title tonight before we get into the heart of our lesson. Good evening, uh, Pastor Ford. Good evening. We have a few that have already chimed in. Uh, the first one is from Carolyn Dees out of Alabama. 
and her title is, Even As We Are Going Through, Our God is Omnipotent and Omnipresent. Amen. Even as we're going through, our God is omnipotent and omnipresent. Amen. Sister Renee Ford submitted, The Just Judge. The Just Judge. Sister Renee Ford just happened to be my wife. That's correct. And Sister Michael's title is, The Lord Will Not Forsake His People. The Lord Will Not Forsake His People. Amen. Uh, Deacon Meadows submitted, My title tonight is The Certainty of God's Justice. The Certainty of God's Justice. Amen. Wow. Reverend Turner uh, also chimed in with, God, the Refuge of the Righteous. God, the Refuge of the Righteous. Amen. We want to thank all you for your time to make this Bible study a little more interactive so we'll know you out there. And for you who didn't submit a, a title, we know you out there as well. And so we want to uh, grow together and experience what the Holy Spirit will do as we dive into God's Word. James Houston also submitted on Facebook, God is our help and mercy. God is our help and mercy. James, Reverend James Houston is watching us from the big city of Monroe. So we thank Reverend Houston for him and his wife, Tina, for watching us, joining us. So what a blessing. Um, and all you who are watching us, we thank you so much. Uh, you could watch any other um, service online, but you chose to watch Grace First Baptist Church. We thank God for his favor. We thank you for your attention. Now we thank the Holy Spirit for his inspired and their infallible word. The title I'm going to use tonight, and I'm going to have it put across the screen, you guys may be able to see it, is how long? Will justice come? How long? It's a question. Will justice come? And as we break this psalm down, I want to look at this psalm in, in three different sections. The first thing I want to look at, the cry for justice. The cry for justice. Number two, the conduct of the wicked. And number three, the confidence of the righteous. So the cry for justice the conduct of the wicked, the confidence of the righteous. And I want to thank um, the Mickey Green and, and Carmen Miles and those guys are here Wednesday night always um, working hard, making sure we can get our live stream up. Um, they are God sent. We appreciate every, every minute they spend uh, working behind the scenes to make this Bible study a huge success. Let's open up into this, this psalm. G. Campbell Morgan said, in this song, we see how the very things with assault, which assault faith and threaten to produce this despair may be made the opportunity for praise and the place and act of worship. So he said, when your faith is assaulted and you're threatened with despair, then this is the opportunity and a place for us to praise God. And worship him. So no matter where we are, no matter what we are going through, we have the opportunity to praise God in whatever place or condition we find ourselves and worship him. Praise is an act of worship. So as we get into Psalm 94, some of you may have this title as well. How long shall the wicked triumph? My question is, how long will God, will justice come? How long will justice come? That's the question. How long will justice come? And so we, we will look at then in verse 1 and 2, we will look at the cry for justice. In verses 1 and 2, we'll look at the cry for justice. Notice how the psalm writer brings us to the cry of justice. He says, O Lord God. Oh, Lord God, he says, oh, Jehovah God, oh, oh, Jehovah, you are self-existence and you, to you, vengeance belong. Oh, God, he talks about the almighty of the power of God. Oh, God, to whom vengeance belong it, show thyself. What he does in the cry for justice in verses one and two, the first thing that he does do is he, he does, he, he shows us the introduction to the cry, the introduction to the cry. 
the introduction to the cry. If you're writing down, thank you, Demetrius, so much for doing this for us. The introduction to the cry. And once again, the introduction is he, he introduces it by way of cry, O Lord God, to whom vengeance belong it, O God, to whom vengeance belong it, show thyself. He calls the name of the, the self-existent God, but then he, he calls out to the God who, who alone has the right to judge. He realized and understand that vengeance belongs to the Lord. He realizes that the Lord will repay the wicked for their wickedness. So he says, O Lord God, Yahweh, the self-existent God, to whom vengeance belong it, O God, the, the almighty God, to whom vengeance belong it, show thyself. Anyway, shine forth. He says, now, since you're the only one that is able to judge, this is the introduction to the cry, as he cries out, he says, the word show forth means to shine forth. Not only shine forth because you alone are able to judge, but shine forth in all your majesty. Remember in Psalm 93, it says the Lord is clothed in majesty, verse 1. It says the Lord is clothed in strength. So what he's saying is show forth your majesty. Show forth your glory as you judge. Isn't that awesome? That our God is the only true judge in all the earth. And when he judges it, he is showing forth his glory. He's showing the world his holiness and righteousness. And that's the God that we serve. So this cry for justice, he introduces us to the cry. And the cry is not really like I read it. It's really a deep cry. He said, oh, Lord, oh, God, to whom vengeance belongeth. Really, how long will, will, will justice come? Oh, God, to whom vengeance belongeth. Lord, show, shine forth. Look what he said in Deuteronomy 32, verse 35. This would aid us. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 35. He says, God says himself, to me belongeth vengeance and recompense. Their foot shall slide in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand. And the things that shall come of them make haste. They, they won't be delayed. That is Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 35. But Romans chapter 12, verse 19 says, Vengeance is mine, said the Lord, and I will repay. Vengeance is mine, said the Lord. And I will repay. Vengeance belongs to the Lord. And the Lord said he will repay. That's Romans 12, 19. It really reads in its, its entirely, dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, said the Lord, Romans 12, 19. Boyce said that Dr. Samuel Johnson, the maker of the first great English dictionary, made a distinction well when he said, Revenge is an act of passion. You do it when you're mad and you're angry and you want to take vengeance. Somebody hurt you or hurt your family and now you want revenge. That's an act of passion. But vengeance is justice. It's justice. Injuries are revenge. Crimes are avenged. And so what he's trying to let you know is when God judge, God doesn't judge out of anger. God doesn't judge out of this this, this heat of the moment, God judges because he's righteous. God judges because he's just. And when God brings vengeance on the unjust or the wicked, it's because he's holy and he's righteous and they transgress his holiness. That's why it's so important that we give our life to Christ. That's why it's so important that we be in the ark of safety. Because when God judges the unrighteous, he does it because he is holy. He is righteous. And vengeance is justice. It's just when God judges because he's the only one in the universe that can judge rightly. Judges sit on benches. They make decisions based on a man-made law that they have, but they cannot judge rightly because they don't hear everything that a person says and they don't see everything that a person does. But the Bible says every outer word that we speak, we shall give an account. God going to judge us by what we say and by what we do. We will not escape the judgment of God. Matter of fact, if you look at 
1 Peter chapter 4, verses 17 and 18, it says, really, judgment will begin at the house of God. And if it first begins with us, what should happen to those who obey not the gospel of Jesus Christ? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? If you and I get in because of the blood of Jesus Christ, we scarcely be saved, then what's going to happen to the ungodly and the sinner when the righteous judge judge it? You see the introduction to the cry? Oh, Lord, he cries out to whom vengeance belonging. Oh, God, to whom vengeance belonging. He repeats it because this is a serious matter. This is a serious cry. Shine forth. Show your glory. Show your holiness. Show forth your majesty. Not only see with the introduction to the cry in verses 1 to 2, but we also see the intensity in the cry. The intensity in the cry. Notice something that the psalmist has really an intensity when he cries out. No, I didn't say the intensity of the cry. This word in is a preposition, of course, of his two, a preposition, and it says a place in his hurt and in his, and in his, his moment of lamentations, uh, lamenting, he cries out, but it's an intense cry. Lift up thyself, thou judge of all the earth. Render or repay a reward to the proud. Don't you know the Bible says God resists the proud, but he give it more grace? Therefore, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord that he may lift you up. What he's telling God is, he says with this intensive cry, raise yourself up, Lord. Thou judge of all the earth. You look at Genesis chapter 18, verse 25. It's a great account of Abraham communing with God about Lot. And in that conversation, Abraham was told that God is going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah and the plains and the cities and the plains. And Abraham, he, he asked the Lord, he said, if you find 50 righteous people in the city, will you spare it? He said, if I find 50, I will. Oh, Lord, he asked the Lord again. He said, well, but what about 45? God said, if they be 45, I will. He goes down again. What about 40? God said, if I find 40 righteous people in the city, I will spare it. Then he says, oh, Lord, what about 35 and 30 and 20 and 50? But let me speak this one more time. And, and, and what about uh, 10? God said, if I find 10, I will spare it. There was not 10 righteous people in the whole city of cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, the only righteous person which was really there was Lot. And look what he says in Genesis 18, 25. That be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked. That be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? You know what he's doing? He is, he is appealing to the justice of God. He knew that the judge of all the earth, when he judges, he judges because he is right. And he knows that God said there's not one, there's not ten righteous people in all the city. You see the intensity in the cry? Raise thyself up, thou judge of all the earth. Render a reward into the proud. Lord, the proud is, is too proudful. They're walking around like a green bay tree. They think nothing can happen to them. They think nothing will come back on their heads. They don't know Murphy's Law. You reap as you sow because they've been sowing dastly deeds and it seemed like they've been getting fat with wealth and money and clothes and prestige. How long, oh Lord, will justice come? Thou judge of all the earth, render, repay them for the evil and the pride that they have. Because, Lord, you know you dislike the proud. You see the cry for justice? You see the introduction to the cry? He cries to the only one that has the right to judge because he's holy and righteous. And judge according to our deeds. For every outer world again, you and I speak, 
we're going to give an account to God. He, he cries to the only one that's able to keep us from falling. We see the introduction to the cry. We also see the intensity of the cry. He wants God to repay them. And when God pays you back, you are paid. None can keep the almighty God from bringing retribution to the wicked. Isn't it good to know, my brothers and sisters tonight, that we are in the family of God. And when God uh, punishes us, he disciplines us because he loves us. But when God punishes the wicked, he punishes them because they, they, what? they have turned their back on God. And now he punishes them for their sin. As we move from the cry for justice, there's the introduction of the cry. There's the intensity in the cry. We move next to the conduct of the wicked. The conduct of the wicked. And we see that in verses 3 through 16. But we would break these verses out in three subpoints. When we look at the conduct of the wicked, the first thing we want to see is the, the abusiveness of the wicked. He starts out in verse 3, Lord, Yahweh, self-existent God, how long shall the wicked, how long shall the wicked triumph? That's his, he talked about, Lord, uh, repay the proud in verse 2. Now he repeats this, this question. He says, how long, how long will you allow the wicked to triumph over the righteous? How long will you allow the wicked to be abusive to the righteous? Look at the abusiveness in verse 4. How long shall they utter and speak insolent things? Their mouths are full of cursing. Their hearts are full of bitterness. And how long will you let them get away with that? Lord, they even are blaspheme that holy name by which we are called. They take your name in vain. They curse the name of Jesus Christ. They curse your Bible. They curse your word. They curse your church. How long will you allow them to speak against us, Lord? How long will you allow them to get away with it? Speaking instant things. That's the question. The abusiveness of the wicked. The first thing he said they do is they speak insolent things. And then, and then he says, and all the workers of iniquity boast themselves. Now, it's not enough that they speak insolent things, but they boast themselves against the Lord and against his people and against his anointed one. Lord, how long will you allow them to speak these violent words? And how long will you allow them to boast in their iniquity. He called them workers of iniquity, boast themselves. They even boast about what they do, how they rob from the poor, how they rob from the widow. Look what he says in Job chapter 20, verse 5. Look what Job says in Job chapter 20, verse 5. Job chapter 20, verse 5. He says, look at verse 4, you got to tie it together. Knowest thou not this of old, since man was placed upon the earth, that the triumph of the wicked is short. He said, don't worry about it. We hear the cry of the psalmist. But, but Job says, don't you know it's been from the old, since man was placed on the earth, that the triumph of the wicked is short and the joy of the hypocrite is but for a moment? Job said, listen, don't, don't cry out too loud. Don't lament too long because it's been written of old since man was on the earth. That, that the triumph of the, of the wicked is short and the joy of those boasts of the proud, look, it's, it's just for a moment. My brothers and sisters, even though they are abusive, Job knew, and the psalmist really know, that they can only last for a little while, that it won't be long. But the question we ask ourselves, why do they have to be in charge anyway? Maybe... God uses that affliction in our lives to bring us closer to him. A lot of times we want to run from affliction. But I told you before, Spurgeon said, affliction is the best bit of furniture in my house. It draws me closer to Christ. 
How else can the Apostle Paul say in Philippians 3.10 that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable to his death? Wait a minute, Apostle Paul. You, you, you want to know him and fellowship of his sufferings? Paul said, because once I'm close to him in sufferings, I can experience his resurrected power working in my life. We want to run from afflictions. Yes, there's some things we don't need to be in, but God puts us through some, some trials and tribulations to bring us closer to Jesus so he can put strength in us to let us know the next time it comes, he will strengthen us again and again. Yes, COVID-19 has a lot of us down, and it's a hurting thing to have over 190,000 people pass away, friends and families and co-workers, affliction. But in the midst of it, God is shaping us and molding us. The wicked can't see that. So they're talking about us in our humbleness, in our meekness. They think we're weak. But when we're meek and humble, that's when we're really strong. We're allowing the power of God to work in our lives so that we can overcome and overcome and overcome. So we can be victors in this Christian walk, in this long journey. Look at the abuse in this continuum. Verse 5, they break in pieces thy people. They break them in pieces with their insolent words. They break them in pieces with their boastful words. They break them in pieces. I wrote this down. One writer said, his name is Charles Spurgeon, words often would more than, words often wound more than swords. They are as hard to the heart as stones to the flesh. And these are proud, are poured forth by the ungodly in redundance. This person said, listen, words are hurtful. Words often wound more than swords. They are hard to the heart as stones to the flesh, and they are poured forth by the ungodly in redundance. They don't stop. They keep going on and on again, and they break God's people in pieces. The nation of Israel was being jeered and and mocked and talked about, and the words was hurting them. Where's your God now? He brought you out of Egypt. Did he bring you out of Egypt just to leave you here? Where is your God? You said the cattle on a thousand hills is is his. Have you heard words like that? If your God loves you, why would he let you be sick? If your God loves you, why do you lose your job? If your God loves you, why do you lose that loved one? My brothers and sisters, the ways of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Because we go through those things, it doesn't mean that God doesn't love us. Everybody goes through those things. Hebrews 9, 27 says, And it is appointed to man once to die, but after this, the judgment. But as we go through, God brings in a tidal wave of refreshing joy into our lives to help us overcome those feelings, that brokenness, those words that wound us like stones in our hearts. Look at the abuseness. They break in pieces the people, thy people, O Lord, and afflict thine inheritance. They afflict us daily. My brothers and sisters, I'm not talking about disease. and I'm not talking about uh, tornadoes and hurricanes. I'm talking about men whose tongues are like razors, whose words cut like a two-edged sword. They hurt the people of God. And it's a shame that even in the church, church people hurt one another with words. We break and destroy one another words. It's not enough that we have to deal with Satan and his army of minions. But we come into the church where we should love one another and be kind to one another and build one another up and pray for one another. And we come into the church and we use words that hateful words and, and hurtful words and, and words that really just build up in our hearts and cause our hearts to break in pieces. And we look around and we say, Lord, how long will we not love one another? Will we not be kind to one another? I'm dealing with non-believers on my job. I'm dealing with non-believers in the grocery store. They're sending texts on the text line. They're sending emails and chats, and they're saying things they shouldn't say about the church. 
Then I come to your house to worship you, to lift up my hands. And somebody's saying, why did I step on their shoe? Lord, I'm worshiping you. I didn't even see their shoe. And they're mad at me and won't speak to me for a couple of months because I forgot to say sorry because I didn't realize that I stepped on their shoe. I sat in their favorite spot. My brothers and sisters, you see the abusiveness of the wicked. It goes on in verse 6. They, not just one of them, it's a group of them. They slay the widow and stranger and murder the fatherless. God has a special place in his heart for the fatherless and the widows. In James chapter 1, verse 27, it's a great verse to memorize, to know, because God really has a heart for the widows and for the fathers. This is what he says. Pure religion, James chapter 1, verse 27, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows and their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. God said, if you want to show pure religion, visit the fatherless and the widows in their afflictions. They have been afflicted by the wicked. They have been afflicted by the naysayers, go visit them, pray with them. Let them know that God hears their cry. Let them know that God sent you by to comfort them. But oh, these wicked, they slay the widow and the, and the stranger and the murderer and they murder their fathers. Oh, my brothers and sisters, do you see the abuse of the wicked? This is the conduct of the wicked. You see the abuse of the wicked, how they abuse their power? They don't understand this power comes from God. Every bit of power we have comes from God. Then how is it when we see God's word, then how can we be behind abusive and wicked leaders? We're inside of the church or outside of the church. How can we look past what they do and say, oh, it's okay because they're doing certain things over here or certain things over there, and it's going to be good for us in the long run. So I'm going to look over that and look over this. Listen, God does not look, overlook their unrighteousness to the widow, to the stranger, and to the fatherless. And if we are to walk in holiness and righteousness, we too as a church body must never overlook the abusiveness of those who are in power and they're taking laws and using their laws and you'll see it to afflict the poor, to afflict the widowsless and the fathers. These are poor people who need the righteous to stand up and plead their cause because God is a God of justice and holiness. Look at verse 7. Yet they say, the Lord shall not see. Wow, they, they say the Lord shall not see. The Lord shall not see, neither shall the God of Jacob regard it. My brothers and sisters, these abusive people are so abusive and so caught up in their wickedness they actually said that the God that we serve is blind to it. The God that we serve doesn't really even take any notice of it. He doesn't pay attention to it. Look at Job 22, verse 13. Job 22, verse 13. Job chapter 22, verse 13. And thou says. How do a God know it? Can he judge through the dark clouds? He, he's surrounded by darkness. He, matter of fact, they say God is privy. He's a part of it. He keeps himself in darkness. So how can, how can he see? How can he know what's going on? Look at Psalm 10, verse 11. Psalms 10, verse 11. Look what it says. He has said in his heart, God has forgotten. He hid his face. He will never see it. The wicked are so full of wickedness that they actually think in their minds 
that God is so God is so caught up in his own things that God is so preoccupied with the universe that he doesn't see it, that he takes no notice of it, and we don't have to worry about anybody judging us because we're in charge of all of these things. And how can people, here's the question, how can people really actually make statements like that? How can people really say that there's no God and that God doesn't see, doesn't know, and that God will not punish them? How, how can people say stuff like that? How can people really open their mouths and say that about our God, our God who knows all things? How can they really say things like that? Somebody help me. How can they open their mouths and blaspheme God like that. I'll help you out in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. Really, let's tie verse 1 in with it. Because verse 1 is very interesting. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, he, he says, here we're talking about the abuse of the wicked, and they're saying God don't see, God doesn't know, uh, God doesn't pay attention, God doesn't regard it. Look at what Timothy says. Now is at this present time, the Spirit is speaking expressly that in the latter times, these times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to the seducing spirits and doctrine of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy. You know why they can say such things? Because they have their conscience seared with a hot iron. His, his explanation of that, they know that they're sinning. They're aware of it. But they do it so much that now their minds and hearts are hardened to it so they can make statements and say, God doesn't see. He doesn't see. He doesn't regard Jacob, this covenant God. He doesn't regard Jacob. It wasn't enough for him to say God. He said, but God of Jacob, this covenant God, he doesn't know. God made this great covenant, Jacob. Now they're mocking the covenant and the God of the covenant. The abuse of the wicked. Yet they say the Lord shall not see. Now shall the God of Jacob regard it. Here then, we move from the abusiveness of the wicked to the appeal to the wicked. The appeal to the wicked. Look what he says in verse 8. Understand, ye brutish, ye senseless among the people, and ye fools, when will you be wise? He's making an appeal to them. He said, listen, you need to understand, you, you senseless people, and you need to be wise, ye fools, for vengeance does belong to the Lord, and the Lord will repay, and your time is really short upon the earth. Tyrants come and go, but the justice of God is the same because he's the same. He never changes. He will put down wicked leaders. He will punish the wicked. Understand, ye brutus, you see the appeal? He, he doesn't bash them in a way. He appeals to them. Some type of, he's trying to appeal to some type of sense of normality, a sense of right within the wicked and the foolish. He said, listen, pay attention to my words. The God that we serve will come for you. The God that we serve will get his man. The God that we serve shoots out an arrow, and his arrow is straight, and it always hits his mark. You will never escape the judgment of God. I don't care who you are. Presidents, kings, vagabonds, poor, rich, black, white, brown, yellow. It does not matter. The God that we serve will hit his mark. Yes, ma'am. Question, Pastor. As Christians, when we, when we sin and, and fall short, are we in some way, form, or fashion mocking the covenant and the God of the covenant? We're not marking the covenant. What is happening, we have given into the temptation. That's why we have 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, 
he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, we're trying to put the, the death, the deeds of the flesh daily. But sometimes we do make a mistake. We have been delivered from the penalty of sin. Christ died on the cross in our places for that. We have been delivered from the power of sin. That's Romans 6, 14. For sin shall have no more dominion over you, for you're not in law but under grace. But we haven't been delivered from the presence of sin yet. So practically, you and I can still sin. And if we get ourselves in a corner, we don't mean to, but we do slip up. That's why we serve a God who forgives us because he knows that we're fickle in our faith. He knows that we have faltering faith, but we are pursuing him at every turn. That's not breaking the covenant because we have a new covenant in Jesus Christ. All the promises of God in Jesus Christ are not nay and yea, but yea. Remember in Deuteronomy chapter 31, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers, in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of Egypt, which my covenant they break. But this shall be the covenant that I make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws in their inward parts and write it in their minds. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall teach them all, every man his brother and every man his neighbor, standing to know the Lord. For they shall all know to me from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will forgive their iniquities and remember their sins no more. God has made a new covenant now. Because God understood that if we had to keep the old covenant, we would have never succeeded. So God said, I'm going to do one better. I'm going to write it in your hearts. I'm going to put it in your minds. And Charles Spurgeon says, to write on a heart, that's pretty amazing. But to write in a heart, only God can do that. And God puts his laws in our hearts. And so, therefore, the Spirit of God convicts us to confess that sin. We don't practice sin like we used to, but the presence of sin is there. And so we have to, we have to what? Read the Word, renew our minds, and confess those sins when the Spirit convicts us of them. Great point. Great question. I like that. So, listen, he makes the appeal. He moves on. In verse 9, he says, the writer is saying, he that planted the ear, shall he not hear? Listen, if you wicked people can hear and God gave you ears, shall he not hear? Wow, what a great question. That's a pressing question. That's a, that's a question that, that goes into the very crevices of the mind of the wicked. If you can hear the cries of the poor and you don't pay attention, don't you know that God hears that cry and he will vindicate them? If he planted the ear, Shall he not hear? If he formed the eye, shall he not see? Wow. What a great appeal. Look at Exodus chapter 4, verse 11. Exodus chapter 4, verse 11. Oh, to have God for our God. The one who made the ear. Eugene Peterson in his message as we turn into Exodus chapter 4, verse 11, Eugene Peterson, his paraphrase of the Bible, called a message. He says, the maker of the ear can hear, and the maker of the eyes can hear. <laughs> you know, he made them all. He can hear. Look at, that was just a paraphrase of the paraphrase. Look at Exodus chapter 4, verse 11. And the Lord said unto him, who had made man's mouth, or who maketh the dumb or deaf, are the sin, are the blind. Have not I the Lord? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. And thou shalt, and he said, O Lord, O my Lord, sin I pray thee by the hand of him whom thou wilt sin. He said, listen, if I made the mouth, Moses, I know how to send you to the people. You say you can't speak, I made your mouth. And if I made your mouth, I can help you speak. I can teach you what to say. Look at Proverbs chapter 20, verse 12. We're still talking about the appeal to the wicked. Look at Proverbs chapter 20, verse 12. Turn into it myself. It says, The hearing and the seeing eye 
The Lord had made even both of them. And if he made both of them, surely he can hear. God doesn't have ears like you and I have. God doesn't have eyes like you and I have. Because God is a spirit. But God is omniscient. And God is omnipresent. God hears all, God knows all, God sees all. The writer uses then anthropomorphism, that's human attributes ascribed to God so that you and I will understand that God hears and sees. And and if you cry long enough, God hears your cry before it came out of your mouth because he's he's an omniscient God. He's he's an all-knowing God. He's he's all-powerful. He's he's a willing God and full of wisdom. So God then hears. It will understand if you and I can hear, surely God can. For he's the maker of heaven and earth. Look at verse 10. He that chastised the heathen, shall he not correct? If God brought Israel out and disciplined the nations for putting them in slavery, shall he not correct you wicked? Do you know that God disciplines us because he loves us? A lot of parents discipline their kids sometime out of anger. Learn to discipline your children out of love and meekness, but discipline them we must. God does discipline us. Look at Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Starting at verse 5. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh to you as unto children. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loved, he chastened, and scourged every son whom he received. Look at verse 11. Now, no chastening for the moment, for the present, seemed to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterwards, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. Righteousness to unto them who are trained thereby. God disciplined us so that we might be partakers of his holiness. He disciplined us because he loves us. He's our father and we his sons and daughters. And he wants the wicked to know as he makes his appeal, he said, listen, he that disciplines the nations, shall he not correct you wicked people? He that teaches man knowledge, shall he not know? He's omniscient. He knows all things. You think God doesn't know. But God knows all things. Wow. God has all knowledge. I said it before. John MacArthur said that God is the only one person that knows everything that he knows. And God knows when the wicked is abusive. God knows when the wicked are are, are afflicting the poor. And God will bring judgment. But the question I ask again, how long will justice come? How long, O Lord, will unrighteousness reign forever? How long, O Lord, will COVID-19 afflict us forever? How long, O Lord, will people die in the streets forever? How long, O Lord, will the poor be able to be, be called on to give their lives over and over again? How long, O Lord, will we look on TV and see widows being taken advantage of and old people being robbed of their money? Lord, I don't mean it in that fashion because we're talking about the elderly. I won't say old because people get on me, but the elderly. How long will, we, will people continue to take advantage of them? How long, O Lord? Sometimes the pain is more than we in the church can bear. What it says in verse 11. The Lord knoweth the thoughts of man that they are vanity. That they are vanity. Futile. Look at Job chapter 11. Anybody know something about going through pain and suffering? It's Job. Job chapter 11, verse 11. Look how Job, Job puts it. He says, he says this. For he knoweth Feudal man. He said wickedness also. Will he not consider it? He, he sees it. He sees the deceitfulness of man. 
He said the wickedness also. Will he not consider it? God knows it. He knows everything. If he corrects, don't you think he'll know? If he's the one who teaches us knowledge, the one who teaches us knowledge, don't you think he knows all things and he knows when the wicked are being wicked and taking advantage of the poor and the fathers and the widows and the righteous and the meek and the gentle and the quiet? He knows all about it. But the psalmist has to make his appeal to the wicked. Then we see the answer in verses 12 through 16, the answer for the wicked. Look at the answer for the wicked. Blessed, happy is the man whom thou discipline. Wait a minute. You just read, Pastor, that no discipline is good for the moment. Oh, but afterwards I read also, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who are disciplined thereby. He knows the man whom he's chastening. And he blesses that man. When God chastens us and blesses us, again, he does it so we might be partakers of his holiness. He does it so that we might grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If you have a little child, and if you don't discipline that child when they're little, you're going to regret it when they get old. That child will embarrass you in the store, will embarrass you at your neighbor's house, will embarrass you at school, will embarrass you on the playground, will embarrass you in the marketplace. If you do not discipline your children with love, they will embarrass you. God says, no, you will not embarrass me as my children. I'm going to discipline you so that you might be partaker of me and my holiness. And when I discipline you, you're going to be blessed. Blessed is the man whom the Lord disciplines. O Lord, and searches him out of thy law. Really, the text is saying, blessed is the man whom thou disciplines and instructs, O Lord, and teaches him out of thy law. That's a blessed man whom God disciplines and instructs. When God disciplines you, he instructs you through the discipline and teaches you out his law. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 18, 18, it says, But grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Listen, when God disciplines us, he's instructing us out of his law. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And as Christians, when we don't do it and we take advantage of them, God disciplines us. But he's moving us towards that what? That great commandment to love the Lord God with all thy heart and soul and mind and body and strength and to love thy neighbor as thyself. That's the answer. Blessed or happy is the man whom the Lord instructs, discipline, and out of that discipline instructs, O Lord, and teaches him out of thy law. That thou mayest give him rest or relief from the days of adversity. My brothers and sisters, we're going to have some more days of adversity. I've been saying this for a while. COVID-19 is bad. But they're going to be something that come down the line that's going to make COVID-19 look like a baby. And what God is doing now, he is disciplining us in this time so that he can bless us through it and give us a relief in the adversity that's coming down the road. We can't see it, but since God knows everything, he sees it all. In verse 12, I want you to see Deuteronomy 8, 5. Because it really goes with it. I overlooked it for a moment, but I want you to look at it. Deuteronomy 8, 5. And it says, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 5. Thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord thy God disciplines thee. Wow. Because we are his sons and daughters. Look at Job chapter 5, verse 17. Job chapter 5, verse 17. So when God disciplines you, rejoice. It hurts. It's grievous. God is doing something. Job chapter 5, verse 17. Job faced the discipline of God. He didn't know why, but God explained it to him later. Behold, Job chapter 5, verse 17. Behold, happy is the man whom God corrected. Therefore, despise not the chastening of the Almighty. My brother and sister, when God disciplines us, do not despise it. 
We ought to be real blessed. We're happy. He loves us just that much. To leave us in all our sins, to leave us in the wrong direction, he corrects us. We find ourselves off center, off course. When God disciplines us, he brings us back to the center of his will, his word, and his way. And when we're there, we can be blessed. Who don't want to be blessed? You want to be blessed? Walk in the will, word, and way of the Lord. And when the Lord disciplines you, count yourself blessed because he loves you. That's the answer to the wicked. He said, you think God is punishing us because he disciplines us? Oh, no. He punishes us because he loves us. Look at Psalm 119, verse 71. This is, this is great. You wouldn't think the psalmist would say this. Oh, but the psalmist did. Psalm 119, verse 71. Look what he says. It is good for me that I have been afflicted that I might learn thy statutes. Oh, man. The psalmist is saying it was good when the Lord afflicted me. So I learned the Lord's law, his statutes, his commandments, his word. That's what statutes mean. It's good for me. My brother and sister, when we go through, it's good for me. Listen, when the Lord, when, when I went through, look, the Lord didn't tear my Achilles. I tore it. But when I went through it, I was going through some affliction and pain. But in the midst of it, God slowed me down and showed me some things he needed to show me. I was trying to get back to be in a hurry, be busy, and God showed me some things. He said, Pastor Ford, you're my son, and, and I called you. You need to slow down and let me work in your life. Let me work in your heart. See, sometimes things come upon us so the Lord can slow us down. COVID-19 has slowed us all down so that we can stop and hear the Lord, so that we can stop and see what God is doing in our lives so that we can stop and give him praise for the things he's already done. Lord, we just want to stop and lift up our hands and say hallelujah. In the midst of COVID-19, we're going through some things, but Lord, we are being afflicted, but you are doing it for our good. Go back to Psalm 94. There's the answer. For the, the wicked. He says also that thou must give him rest from the days of adversity into the pit be digged for the wicked. His answer, to the, his answer for the wicked, he said, listen, God going to give us, after he disciplined us, he going to give us rest and relief from the days. Notice what he said. There will be days of adversity in our lives. You don't believe me? Let me show you all the text. Because we don't feel like God should have bring any adversity into our lives. Every day ought to be a holy day. Every day ought to be a good day. Listen, even though I'm having a bad day, I'm still blessed. I can still praise the Lord. You can still glorify the Lord. Look at James chapter 1. I got this memorized, but I want you to see it. James chapter 1. James says in James chapter 1, verse 2 and 3, My brother, count it all joy when you fall in the diver's temptation. Knowing this, that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have a perfect work, verse 4, that ye may be perfect and entire, liking nothing. Do you see, my brothers and sisters? We all are going to go through some trials and tribulations in our life. But let patience work in your life. The wicked thinks because we're going through adversity that God doesn't love us. No, God is producing patience in me. God is producing peace in you. God is producing joy in you. God is blessing you. God is producing holiness in us so that when people see us the next time, when the days, that's plural, when the days of adversity come again, we can handle them better. Because we know that God will put strength in us. Oh, there will be another day of adversity. And when it comes, I know who I can call upon. I can call upon the name of Jesus. And he will stabilize me. And he will strengthen me. And he will comfort me. Until the pit be digged for the wicked. And they slip into the very bottom of the abyss. You know what the abyss is? Another name for Hades hell. That's the pit. He's not talking about, this is vivid language here. He's saying, listen, he's going to dig a pit for the wicked and they're going to fall in it themselves. And once you fall into the pit of separation God from God throughout eternity, hell and, and Haiti, you will never recover from that. Oh, wow, my brother says, what a great psalm. But the question we still ask ourselves, how long will justice come? We're crying night and day. 
But the Lord gives the answer to the wicked and he gives the answer to the righteous. Look what he says in verse 14. He's really responding to the wicked. For the Lord will not cast off forever. The word cast off means abandon. The Lord will not cast off forever. God hasn't cast off Israel. He will not cast off the church. He's building this church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. Will the Lord cast off forever? Will he abandon his people? No, he will not cast off forever. Neither will he forsake inheritance. He will not forsake Israel, and he will not forsake the church because the church is the body of Christ. Look at Job 23, verse 6. Job 23, verse 6. Job says it clear and loud as he's speaking with his friends, and Job... Job really cries out this. Job 23, verse 6. Would he plead against me with his great power? No, but he will put strength in me. Job said he, he will not destroy me. He will not commit, contend with me or against me, but he will put strength in me. He will take note of me. He will pay attention to me. The wicked said God will not re regard us. Job says he will pay attention to us. He will put strength in us. I am weak, but through Christ I am strong. I lose my joy sometimes because I let the world trample over it. But Jesus is giving it to me. He says, my joy I leave with you. Not as the world give it to you, the joy I give. Let not your heart be troubled, my brothers and sisters. For the Lord will not cast off forever. I don't care what you're going through now. Listen to me. Whatever you may be going through, God hasn't cast you off. You may have lost your job during COVID-19. God hasn't cast you off. You might not know how you're going to pay the bills right now, but God hasn't cast you off. You are God's inheritance, we, heritage and inheritance, and we are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. And the God that we serve, as long as we are faithful to him and crying out to him, God has not abandoned us. God has not left us as orphans because through Christ we become his sons and daughters again. And everything that we need, God will provide for us through Christ. If the Lord freely gave up Christ for us all, how shall he not freely with Christ give us all things? My brothers and sisters, we're going through some adversities, but hang on in there. The winds are blowing. The rains are heavy. I hear the thunder and I hear the billows waving and the dashes are breaking against my house, but the Lord hasn't abandoned me. Here he comes. He's coming from his high place in heaven. He's coming. He's coming with power. He's coming in righteousness. He will steady the storm. He will bless his people. He will will speak and say, peace be still. He will provide everything that I need because the cattle on a thousand hills is his. Here's our Savior. He's in the band us. He's Jesus the righteous, and he's coming back one day for his own. My brothers and sisters, I can rejoice in the midst of COVID-19 because I know who Jesus is. He is a refuge. He is a strong tower and a very present help in time of trouble. And the Spirit of God is moving right now, my brothers and sisters. He wants you to know that Jesus Christ is your help. The old preachers say, I feel my help coming. Hey, my help is already here. He's, he never leaves me, nor forsake me. He's always somewhere around me. My brothers and sisters, whatever you're going through, the Lord has not abandoned you. The Lord will not forsake you. The Lord will come to your rescue. 10,000 people may be against you, but it won't come near you because the Lord is your shepherd and you shall not want. Remember what he said. No weapon formed against you can prosper. Oh, they do hurt. We will cry out. But in the nick of time or at the right time, it really means that the nick of time, God will come through. Hasn't God always come through? Hasn't God blessed you when you didn't have food on your table, when you didn't have enough gas in your car, when you didn't know where your next dollar was going to come from? Didn't God come through? If he came through then, he will come through now. And if we live tomorrow, the same God will come through. You can take it to the banks of heaven. You know how I know? Because he has come through. But judgment shall return into the righteous. And all, and all the upright in heart shall follow it. Listen, God will bless the righteous. And we will follow the justice of God. 
With all our hearts, we shall follow it. They said God will cast us off. He says, no, but God will bring, but that's a contract. But God, judgment shall return into the righteous. God will, God will vindicate his righteousness. Don't worry about it. He will do it. It will come. And all the upright in heart shall follow it. Follow hard after God. Follow hard after his laws. Follow hard after his precepts. Verse 16, he's still getting an answer. Who will rise up for me against the evildoers? Or who will stand up for me against the workers of iniquity? That's the question he asks. Because the righteous, the wicked is still trying to mock the righteous. He says, but God, here's the question, but it's rhetorical. He knows who's going to stand up for him. He knows who's going to rise up against the workers of iniquity. So he moves from the conduct of the wicked, the abusiveness of the wicked, the appeal to the wicked, and the answer for the wicked. And then he moves to the confidence of the righteous in verses 17 through 23. Look what he says. Unless the Lord had been my help, he asked a question, two questions in verse 16. He answered it in verse 17. He's talking about God's vindication for the righteous. The confidence of the righteous, God vindicates the righteous. Look what he says. He asked the question again, who will rise up for me against the evildoers? Or who will stand up for me against the work of the niggas? Unless the Lord, Yahweh, had been my help, my soul, my, my soul would soon have, what? Dwelt in silence. You know what dwelt in silence mean? Have died. That's a euphemism for have died. Here's his confidence. The Lord was my help. He kept me from dying. When at a time, when is a, a word for time, when at a time I is a personal pronoun, when I said my is a personal pronoun, when I said my foot, he's giving his testimony now, my brother and sister. He said, when I said my foot slipped, thy mercy, O oh Lord, help me up. Here, let me stop and ask this question, my brother and sister. How many times our feet almost slip and the mercy of God held us up. Can you think about a time when you almost slipped and the mercy of God held you up? Do you see how good God is? That even in slippery places, he's able to put our feet on firm and solid ground. Unless the Lord had been my help, my soul had almost dwelt in silence. When I said my foot slipped, thy mercy, that new mercy every day, That new mercy that I need to depend upon. That new mercy, Lord. Oh, Lord. He said, oh, Yahweh. Turns of endearment. Oh, Yahweh. Held me up. It's God's mercy that we're, it's because of God's mercies that we are not consumed. His mercies endure forever. His mercies are everlasting. And he holds us up with his mercy. God vindicates the righteous. Look what he says in my, my position in the multitude of my thoughts, when I was anxious within me, thy comforts to light my soul. What comforts? He just told you about God's comfort. He says, God helped me. If he didn't, I would have died. When my thoughts was anxious, he comforts me. How? His mercy kept me from slipping. He says, those comforts and many other comforts, they delight me. Oh, Lord. They delight my soul. They keep me going. Listen, we're not the richest people in the world, but we're rich in grace and mercy. And when God does us for what he does for us, when he does it, man, it delights our soul. Let me help him finish up. But I always tell my life, I said, baby, look how far God has brought us from. Look at what we have. And when I think about how God kept us from slipping, when I think about how we cried out and God was our help, when I think about how the Lord has kept our anxious thoughts together. And then within me, I delight in his comforts. I don't have a lot, but somehow I have everything that I need. God is a gracious God. Somebody needs to try this God today. Somebody needs to give their life to the Son of God and experience what we're trying to, you, what we experience with God, that God is a very present help in time of trouble, that God will provide for his people. That's why Paul said in Philippians 4, 19, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. 
within me, thy comforts delight my soul. He goes on. Shall the throne of iniquity fellowship with thee? Which, I wish I had more time to get this verse. Which devises mischief by law. He said, listen, these guys sit on their thrones. They make a law. Then they break the law and say they were, what they're doing within the law. Isn't that something? They make a law. They do things contrary to the law. And then when they get caught, they say, what I'm doing, the law said I can do. Doesn't that sound like what's going on today? We have laws all around us, but people are breaking the laws. And when they break the law, they're saying, well, the law said I can break it. And they're stretching the law so much so that laws are not laws anymore. What good is the law if we can't keep the law, if we can't live by the laws, if we can't show people the honor of living by the law. Look what Amos said in Amos chapter 3, verse 6. We winding down. I'm so excited about this, but I'm going to slow down. Amos chapter 6, verse 3. I got it right here. Look what it says. Ye that put far away the evil day, and cause the seed of the violence to come near. Ye that put far away the evil day. Wow. Woe to you and cause the day of doom to come. You say you're going to put the evil away, the evilness away, but then you call the day of doom to come. You make a law, then you break the law you made, and then you say, I broke it because I'm, I'm doing it because the law said I can do it. You that say we're going to do away with evil, but yet you bring Doom to the people. Wow. But God vindicates the righteous. Verse 21. They gather themselves together against the soul, against the life of the righteous, and condemn the innocent blood. Look at Psalm 106, verse 38. Let's move quickly. Psalm 106, verse 38. We're winding up. Psalm 106, verse 38. Guess what it says? And shed innocent blood, even the blood of their sons and their daughters, whom they sacrificed in the idols of Canaan, and the Lord land was polluted with their blood. You gather yourself together against the life of the righteous and condemn the innocent blood. Look at Exodus chapter 23, verse 7. Exodus 23, verse 7. Exodus 23, verse 7, it says, Keep thee far from a false matter, and the innocent and righteous slay thou not, for I will not justify the wicked. He said, listen, you are what? You are condemning innocent blood, but God said you need to keep it far from you, and you need to protect them, because I will not justify the wicked. I will not uphold the wicked. I will bring the wicked to their appointed end. One more. Look at Proverbs 17, verse 15. Quickly, Proverbs 17, verse 15. He that justified the wicked and he that condemned the just, even they both are abominations to the Lord. So you justify the wicked because you want something from them and you condemn the just, you both are abominations to the Lord. And the Lord will not justify you, but the Lord will vindicate his people. Look at verse 22. But... The Lord is my defense. Oh, he's still giving his testimony. God vindicates the righteous. Look what he says. But the Lord is my defense. Is the Lord your defense? Has the Lord defended your honor? Has the Lord defended you on his job? Has the Lord defended you in his church? Has the Lord defended you in the marketplace? Has the Lord defended you? He said, the Lord is my defense. And my God is the rock of my refuge. He says, God is a big time mountain and nobody can break through this mountain because God is my defense. He's my rock and refuge. God vindicate the righteous. And in that vindication, this psalmist gives his personal testimony to the wicked. It's good to know that God is our defense. He defends us from things seen and unseen. We got here tonight driving on the highway 
You go to work every day driving on the highway. There's some things you don't see, and God is your defense. You lay down at night, and you close your eyes, and you're sleeping, and you don't know what's going on all around you, but God is your defense, and God is your refuge, and God kept you last night, and God kept you throughout the day, and you ought to give him some praise, for he is holy and righteous, and God vindicates his people. And finally, God severs the wicked. Look at verse 23. God severs the wicked. Look at verse 23. And he shall bring upon them their own iniquity and shall cut them off in their own wickedness. Stop. The word means to destroy. God vindicates the righteous. God severs the wicked. He shall cut them off. He shall destroy them. In other words, God will punish them in hell. That's the vividness of the text. We're not sugarcoating it. There's a heaven to gain or lose. There's a hell that people already go to. God will cut off the wicked in their own iniquity and shall cut them off in their own wickedness. In other words, God will use their own wickedness as they do wickedness to destroy them. Isn't that something? Here the wicked, doing wicked, think they get away with it, but their own wickedness is going to be their downfall. You don't have to try to get revenge. Vengeance in mind, said the Lord. They are practicing wickedness. They are doing wickedness. But their own wickedness that they're done will be their downfall. Their own wickedness, yea, our God shall cut them off using their own wickedness against them. And when God cut you off, you are cut off forever and ever and ever. How long? Will justice come? Sure it will. God will vindicate the righteous. God severs the wicked. He will come through. He will show himself holy and righteous. Will not the judge of the earth, whole earth, do right? Then what does it mean for you and I? His application point is we close. If God took all our sins and place them on Jesus on the cross and took his wrath and poured it out on his only begotten son who died not only for our sin, but died in our places. This is called a substitution and atonement. If God poured out his full wrath on his son for our sins, shall he not pour out that same full wrath in hell against the wicked? Shall he not cut them off in righteousness? Sure, the wicked, they sprout up like the grass in the morning time. But when the heat come, they wither, they moan down and thrown into the fire. That's the application. If God gave up Christ for all of us and placed the, his wrath on Christ for you, for your sins and my sins, don't you think God is going to judge the wicked? Don't you think God is going to punish the wicked? How long? It won't be long. How long? It won't be long. God is coming back. Christ is coming back to judge the wicked and vindicate the righteous. All we have to do is stand back and see the salvation of the Lord. Here's the point. How long will justice come? The cry of the righteous. We introduce you to the cry. The intensity of the cry. Then we show you the conduct of the wicked. We showed you the abuseness of the wicked and the appeal to the wicked and the answer for the wicked. And then we showed you, in, and finally we showed you the confidence of the righteous. He used pronouns like I and my, my defense. Within me, thy confidence is like my soul. He is my rock, my refuge. God vindicates the righteous. God severs the wicked. He cuts them off forever. They will never be remembrance of the wicked. Nobody's 
talking about wicked men like they talk about Dr. Martin Luther King. Nobody's talking about wicked men like they talk about Dr. Billy Graham. Nobody's talking about wicked men like they're talking about Charles Spurgeon or John Lewis. Nobody's talking about wicked men like they're talking about Jesus day in and day out. How long will will justice come? Sure it will. But wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. And he shall strengthen our heart. Psalm 27, 14 says, wait, I say, on the Lord. Amen. Somebody here tonight, you too have been asking the question like the psalmist, how long? How long, O oh Lord? And you like patience and peace because you're not in Jesus Christ. And you can't seem to grasp that in the midst of these afflictions and trials and tribulations, God is working on the building. He's building his church one person at a time. And these lot of afflictions are working for us a far seeing way to glory. While we're looking at things that are not seen, we're looking at things that are not unseen, but the things that are not seen, but the things that are seen. We don't put too much stock in the things that are seen. We look at the things that are not seen. But you need to come to Jesus so that he can open up your eyes like he opened up my eyes and all the eyes of those who ever believed in him from ages past into the present time. Yes, the wicked think they're getting by, but they're coming to an abrupt end. Don't worry about the wicked. Worry about your own soul salvation. Give your life to Christ tonight. Let God work in and through you. I'm talking about God is spirit. To produce holiness and righteousness, patience and peace and joy. And those things the world didn't give and those things the world can't take away. No matter what goes on in the midst of COVID, we're still blessed. In the midst of the economic downturn, we are still blessed. Will you come to Jesus tonight? And so, Lord Jesus, I don't know there is the, I ought to know about you, but I know this. I'm in a desperate place, and I need to be saved. I need to be rescued out of my sins, out of my misery, out of my hatred, out of my bitterness, because I see the rick, wicked prospering, and my heart is hard. And, Lord, if you don't come into my heart and make me whole again, I will break in pieces with bitterness and hatred and anger. If you just accepted Christ, will you let us know about it? Will you let us know that you love him and you want to know more about him? Our information is coming up on the screen. You see our phone number, our website, our email. You can get in touch with us by those three means. We do have Sister Miles on the chat line, let us know that you're tired of running. You're tired of the weight of sin weighing you down and the anger and the bitterness just causing you to be bitter and you can't really focus. Come to Jesus just as you are. Or you may be listening you need a church home and you want to grow with us and you're excited about how we're going through the Psalms and we're learning more about Christ than we ever learned before. And we know our type of God that we serve that God does discipline us because he loves us, but he's doing it for our own benefit. And that God blesses us even in the midst of the storms. And God has so many more blessings that await us as we walk in his will, his word, and his way. You can become a great part of Grace First Baptist Church no matter where you are. We welcome you no matter who you are. Please come out from the, come out from the, the cold and the rain and come into the warmth of the church of Jesus Christ. Pray that you have accepted Christ, pray that you will let us know that you want to be a part of this fellowship and we would receive you and accept you. Once again, it's out of the office, yours to receive or reject. Once again, we ask you to pray for those on our prayer list. Brother Joe Wilson again is going to have surgery on Tuesday. 
Pharisee's mother, Mary Brohannon's sister, Eleanor Denny recovering, Sister Simmons, who's going to have surgery in a couple of weeks, Linda Anthony's father, Sister Tommy Lee's mother, stepmother. Pray that something was said tonight that would draw you close to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ or cause you to fall down on Jesus and give your life to him. Thank you, Grace First Baptist Church, for being you, for loving the Lord with all your hearts and soul and mind and body and strength, for giving of your time, for giving of your prayers for me and for our church and for God's people, for giving of your service. Not that we can serve in person, but you're giving of your resources. So you can't serve the God, in per- God in person, but you can serve God through giving of your tithes and offering. So we thank you so much. To whom much is given, much is required. But listen, you can't beat God giving. And when you give, he'll open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you won't have room enough to receive it. Seems like every time I give love, the Lord, the more I give, the more he gives me. And I don't give to get. I give because it's my duty out of my love for Jesus. But thank you for sharing and giving. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and give you peace. Not only the Grace family, but all those out there who've been sharing with us and giving from Ohio and Alabama and Nebraska and Harlan, Harlandale and many other places. We thank you for being generous. Pray the Lord will bless you by opening up the windows of heaven in your life, giving you strength, giving you peace, giving you resources, giving you more love, giving your children more strength to keep on keeping on. As we close, remember, God is love. And we're to be about, about loving as God loved. Next week, we'll be in Psalm 95. We'll be in Psalm 95. We're going to have a great time in Psalm 95 before we get into the kingdom songs again, Psalm 96 through 99. Invite somebody to watch. Let us have a watch party next Wednesday night and Sunday. And we're going to go and finish up with an unknown woman as she comes to Jesus with an issue of blood as she deals with the pain and hopelessness. My brother and sister, it's going to be a great sermon, not because I say it, because the Holy Spirit says, and you're going to see some great things that can help us all as we're dealing with the pain of hopelessness. We thank the Lord once again. Let us all stand, you who are watching by YouTube, you who are watching by Facebook, Thank you so much for your prayers and your presence. And now, Lord God, we bow in your presence once again. Thank you for who you are and for the great things you've done in our lives. Thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, we took the time to go through your scriptures tonight. Pray, Lord, that when we ask the question, how long would justice come? And you hear the cry of the righteous. And you see the conduct of the wicked. Put confidence in us to know that you will vindicate us and you will judge the wicked in their own wickedness. And we will come out looking like Jesus. Oh, Lord, we thank you. COVID-19 try to bind us, but the saints of God are not bound. We might not be able to come to church in person, but, oh, Lord, we're having church. We're praising you on Wednesday night. We're praising you on Sunday. We're praising you in our homes. We're praising you in our living rooms and our bedrooms. And we're praising you in our kitchen and our dens and our garage. We're lifting up our hands on the way to work. We're thanking you for the great things you have done. We're praising you because you are worthy to be praised. We're not going to let COVID-19 keep the church from being the church. We're going to be wise as serpents, harmless as doves. We're going to wear our masks, have our social distancing. We're going to pray, but we're going to glorify the Lord. Thank you once again for being who you are. Thank you once again for the United States of America, the country you have blessed. May you touch the heart of the president and the vice president and all those government leaders. Lord, may you give them guidance and direction to lead this country and the way you have to go. And may you bless the church and all those pastors and preachers and Sunday school teachers and superintendents and deacons who are doing your work and your will, all those servants. Lord, will you bless them in a special way and let them know only what they do for God will last. Pray for the poor. Pray for the peace of Israel. For you say, pray for Israel, for they shall prosper that love thee. Pray now, Lord for the loss that they can be found. 
praying that you give us travel and grace and mercy as we leave this place, but never from your presence. Lord, when we lay down at night, you said that we should praise you in the morning for your, your loving kindness, your mercy, and then praise you at night for your faithfulness. So tonight when we lay down, let us praise you for being faithful and keeping us throughout the day. Oh, Lord, our Lord, I ask in your name and all the earth. We thank you. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, and all God's people say amen and amen. Thank you so much. We'll see you next week. Same bat channel, same bat time.